writing if statements to look at check boxes and radio buttons. They each take a different approach and you want to make sure you do it right. Otherwise, the code police could come after you. Let me show you how. All right, so I've got an example here to show you how to work with check boxes and radio buttons. Now what I've done is in my common controls is I have gotten a container. If I come under here to containers, I put a, two group boxes on the form, one called accessories and one called RAM. I don't want to put a third one on the screen. So, uh, and then inside of that, I either put check boxes or I put radio buttons. And then I set the text properties to these captions right here. And I set the dot text property to these captions right here. The names I set to something reasonable. Let's watch the program run. I'll come up here and hit start and get this on the screen. And let me minimize my Visual Studio. If I pick onboard graphics and four gigabytes of RAM, total cost is $20. If I go to eight gigabytes of RAM, you see with the radio button, the four gigabyte option turns off because of these four radio buttons inside this group box, only one of the four can be turned on. That is the nature of radio buttons, sometimes called option buttons. I can only have one of them turned on. So if I go to 64 gigabytes of RAM and say total price, it's $250. And I turn a label on, oh yeah. If I go to four gigabytes of RAM, the cost will be back to $20. If I pick another video card, do you notice when I clicked on the second video card, it did not turn the first checkbox off. So I could have all of these turned on, or I could just pick one of them or pick two of them. And if I pick two of them, they're going to be in the cost, okay? And then the RAM's going to be in the cost as well. Now, if I end the program here and we want to look at the code, the way I go into the code is to double click on the command button on this button right here. And that's going to bring me into button calculate click. But before I get into how we do this button, I'm going to scroll up here and just inside the class form one, I have created a set of constants and this holds the different costs for the RAM. And then I did the same thing for the video cards. I set the cost of the video cards as constants at the form level, at the class level. So these can be seen in the entire program. They can be seen in any one of these subs. So getting into button calculate click, let's look at how it works. Well, first I'm going to write an if statement to see a nested if statement to see if which radial button has been picked. So you, to write an if statement in C sharp, you say if open parenthesis, then what you're going to compare, in this case, I'm looking at the checked property of the radio button rad 4 gb which is this button right here. If you look at it in the properties window, if I set my uh, properties to alphabetical, up here at the top, the name is rad 4 gb If I go back to my code window, since I already have it open, I can just click up here. You can see its name, dot checked. Remember, you have to capitalize things in C sharp and C++. Equal, equal, true. When you're comparing two things, you have to use a double equal sign. So I'm saying if rad dot checked is true, then I'm going to make the RAM cost, this is my variable, I'm going to set it to the constant des 4GB cost, and you see that has a value of 20. Now, if this is not true, I'm going to say else. And then in the else, I have another if statement. So if rad 8 gigabytes is true, I'm going to set the cost to 8. Else, I'm going to check for 32 gigs. 
set the cost to 32. If that's not set else, I'm going to check for, oh yeah, in other words, 64 gigs of RAM. And then in this one as well, I set the foreground color of the label, oh yeah, to red, and I made it visible. So we had a little bit of an Easter egg there in this program. Now, for radio buttons, only one of the radio buttons will be turned on. So we're going to use an if, else if, else if, else if. Because as soon as one of these conditions becomes true, it will do the true part of the if statement, and it will not continue through these other options wasting CPU time. Now in this case it doesn't matter because we're just clicking on a button and it's looking at four choices. But if you were doing this in a loop and trying to do it millions of times per second, not putting this in a nested if statement would slow your program down. Now, on the other hand, if we look at checkboxes, we have to do these as separate, four separate if statements, because remember, on the checkboxes, all or none of them in any combination could be turned on, so we have to check for each one separately. So the way I do this is there's a little nuance to this. So once again, I'm, I'm looking at the checked property for true. If check onboard for the onboard graphics is set to true, then the video cost is set to, in this case, it's zero for onboard. Okay, I just set it to the first choice. Then I'm checking for the NVIDIA 2080 Ti. If, if that one is checked, I'm going to add the cost of the NVIDIA. $1,500 is going to be added to the video cost. Okay. For all these other checkboxes inside the body of the if statement, I have to say plus equal. I can't just say equal. If, if I just said equal on these, then I would only be picking up the price of the last checkbox that is clicked. I have to say plus equal because remember what plus equal does. Plus equal says add this to the value of death's video cost. So there's a different technique here, okay? We have to have separate if statements for checkboxes, and we have to have a nested if statement for radio buttons. That's the main gotcha. Now finally, at the bottom of the sub, I'm gonna take these two costs, I'm gonna add them to my total, and then I'm gonna take the total, turn it into a string, and put it into my total label on the screen, which is this label right here. Now, that's pretty much it the pro that's pretty much the program okay now if, if i wanted to add another checkbox or another ram option i could make my group box a little bigger i could come up here to a uh, radio button and i could just add another radio button okay so i'm just adding them or i could uh, i could just double click a radio button onto the form and then of course you want to go through the steps of clicking on the radio button coming over to your properties window giving it a better name than radio button one radio button two and then setting the text property instead of radio button one and radio button two to something more appropriate so that's how you add them if you if you want here, I'll put these right here. So now they are not in the group box, okay? And isn't that convenient? It changed the font size to something small, which is fine. I don't care. Let me run the program here and show you what happens now. So now I have two different groups of radio buttons. The group of radio buttons that's on the form, one of those two can be selected. And inside this group box, I have a separate group. So if you need multiple groups of radio buttons, you need a group box or a container of some sort to hold them. Now, of course, I don't want these on my project, so I'm going to end my program. I'm going to come back and get rid of these. Doesn't matter for checkboxes because all checkboxes can be turned on or turned off independently of the other checkboxes. Now, I want to show you one other subtlety. When I run the program,
there's not a radio button selected. But as soon as I click on one, it, it it's impossible to get them all unselected again unless I write code to do that. It's probably a good idea in your form load event to turn one of these radio buttons on in the group to start with or to set it at design time. So that's easy enough. Let's set it at design time. I'll hit stop right here. I'll click on four gigabytes of RAM. I'm going to come down to its checked property and set it to true. So now when it runs the program, it will be defaulting to uh, four gigabytes of RAM. All right, so the next thing I want to do with this is set a breakpoint and step through this code with the debugger. So I'm going to put a breakpoint right here on line 52. I click in the gray margin, it puts a red circle and highlights that line. It means it's going to run my program normally until it hits this line of code, and then I'm going to be able to single step over my code so we can see it run. So let's start the program. Let me pull it onto the screen. Let's pick that big NVIDIA RTX 2080 and 64 gigs of RAM and say total price. So now I have hit my breakpoint. So the first thing it's going to do is look at RAD 4GB to see if it is true or not. And as you, if you look at the tooltip, it says it's false. So I'm going to come up to my toolbar up here and say step over. It's going to skip over the true part of that if statement and go on to the second if statement. Now it's going to look to see if rad 8 gigabytes is set to true and it's set to false. So when I hit step over, it's going to skip to the third if statement. So rad 32 gigabytes is also false. So it's going to skip over that and now it's going to hit the one that's true because rad, oh yeah is set to true. So when that's set to true, if I say step over, it's going to step into the true part of this if statement. It's going to set the cost to 64 gigabyte cost, which is $250. Change the color of the oh yeah label to red and make it visible. Now we're going to go into our checkboxes. Right now, my video cost is set to zero. I started it out at zero. And the onboard is set to false. It's unchecked. So it's going to skip over that if statement, go to the next one. The 2800 is set to true. So it's going to do the true part of this if statement. It's going to add $1,500 to the video cost, which is currently zero. I'll hit step over. So now you can see my cost is 1500. The Third checkbox is unchecked. It's not true. It's going to skip over that one. The fourth checkbox is also not true. It's going to skip over that one. And then I'm going to add my cost, $250 plus $1,500. My total is $1,750, and it's going to put it in a label so we can see it on the screen. So now I can come up here and hit continue, and then we can see the result of my program. A couple other little things I can show you here is one thing to realize, I'm going to turn this breakpoint off, is what is be inside of it, the parentheses of an if statement, just has to evaluate to true or false. So since checked is a property that can only be true or false, I can actually just say if rad 4 gb equals checked. Because the checked property, I'm going to take this out of all four of these. Oops, I don't want to lose my parenthesis. That would be a bad thing. All four of these, the checked property is going to be true or false. So if I put that breakpoint back in, let me hit save all, my favorite button, and run my program. And this time, let me check 8 gigabytes of RAM and an NVIDIA GeForce, say total price. So right now you can see RAD 4GB is set to false, step over. RAD 8GB is set to true. It's going to set my cost to $30 for that RAM. 
And then since this one is true, it will not do this else, which means it will not do this if, so it will not do that else. It's going to skip over, and now it's going to go through the checkboxes until it gets down to G-Force, and it's going to add $200 to the cost because of the G-Force. So now we can get down here and see our total cost is $230. Uh, 200 for the video card, $30 for the RAM, and I'll hit continue and we will see the result in the label. So you don't have to be as wordy. For beginner students, I usually do it this way. Just because that's a little more clear. We're saying the checked property seeing if the check property is set to true. But remember, whatever's inside this parentheses just has to evaluate to true or false. Now, another thing that I tend to do that you strictly don't have to do is at the end of every if statement, end of every statement, you notice all these statements here have to have a semicolon on, on them or I'm going to get an error. I'm just in the habit of putting a semicolon at the end of all my statements even though the close brace stands in for a semicolon, that's just me, you know, you don't have to do that. If you see that in any of my other examples, that's just a style I've gotten used to. But the other thing I like to do with my if statements is I like to have the open brace on its own line and the close brace on its own line. Uh, some programmers do it this way. They put the open brace on the same line as the if to make their code a little tighter. And strictly speaking, if you only have one statement inside your if statement, you don't need braces at all because if this is true, if this if statement is true, it does the very next line of code and this semicolon says that's the end of the if statement. So you can do it this way as well. I do not like doing that. I like to have the braces, always have the braces, even if I have one line of code. Because look what happens right here on my, oh yeah. Okay, if, if I don't have these braces, if I just have it like this, okay, and it's indented, so it looks, visually it looks like all three of these lines of code are going to happen if oh yeah is true. Well, the end of the if statement's right here. That is the only thing that's going to happen if oh yeah is true. This will always happen now, no matter what, because these have nothing to do with that if statement. So that's why I have developed the habit over the years of trying to stay out of trouble, trying to avoid bugs of always putting braces around the true and the false parts of my if statements. So that about sums it up. That's a quick walkthrough of how you code for radio buttons with a nested if and for checkboxes with separate if statements. Hope you enjoyed it. Please subscribe and hit that bell if you want to get notifications of my next video. Thanks a lot.